Today, I'm Joe from Creation Ministries International, and this is my colleague. Oh, g'day. My name is Dr. Jonathan Safadi, PhD Chemistry, a head scientist of Creation Ministries International USA, although I'm originally from Australia and New Zealand. So, Jono, today we'll be speaking about chemical evolution and the origin of the first life. So, you know, when we speak about evolution, there's a few different types of evolution. We have cosmic evolution, that's how the planets come together. We have the chemical evolution, that's the idea that out of a primordial soup, the first living cell came about. And then we have biological evolution, that's the idea that from that one cell that formed, it evolved into all other living creatures today. And of course, the other types, there's geological evolution and things like that. But when we say chemical evolution, nowadays many evolutionists, they come along and say, oh no, that, that's not evolution. Big Bang, that's not evolution. Chemical evolution, that's not evolution. Evolution is just about biology, it's just about natural selection. It's not about the origin of the first life. So what do you think about that? Well, I mean, often they don't even know the term chemical evolution is a very widely accepted term in the literature. They say, well, origin of first life isn't evolution, it's abiogenesis. So mm. it's good to remind them that the uh, an accepted term is chemical evolution, showing that it really is part of the evolutionary worldview. Materialists need to have some form of chemical evolution to explain how life got here. And you got to experts like uh, Gerald Kirkett, late Gerald Kirkett from Southampton, wrote a book called Implications of Evolution, and he said there's a theory that all living forms in the world have arisen from a single source which itself came from an inorganic form. This theory can be called the general theory of evolution. So he's defining the general theory as including the origin of first life from non-living chemicals. Yes, so evolution is from the middle of the last century. They all recognize that this is part of evolutionary theory. So when this evolution is trying to change the meaning of the word evolution to just include biological evolution, that's really historical revisionism. They're trying to change history. So why do you think that they have to change the meaning of the word? Well, they, they're losing the argument. They know that they don't even want to deal with the huge chemical and informational problems of explaining where the first cell came from. And also they can't invoke natural selection because natural selection says this thing is fitter than this thing. Therefore, this thing leaves more offspring. So what do you need for natural selection? Reproduction. So you can't use natural selection to explain the origin of reproduction. It must presuppose repro that reproduction is already in existence before you can talk about selecting. Uh, it's like uh, the runners on a, on a starting line, they're all dead at the starting line. They can't get anywhere. They can't even get started. Okay, so Jono, you've pointed out that natural selection is irrelevant unless we first have the first living cell. And in our previous discussions, I think our speakers have actually talked about how complex a cell is. I mean, you can't um, we talk about biological robots, we talk about cell complexity. But in this discussion, we're just going to talk about the chemistry and how the first living cell came about. And when we talk about that, you know, be, the first thing that comes to mind is the Miller-Urey experiment. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure we are all familiar with that. And the Miller-Urey experiment is two scientists in the middle of the last century, they came along, they took some gas, they put some sparks through it, and they got some organic molecules. And they claim that that's how the first living cell formed. What's wrong with it? Oh, just about everything is wrong with it. In fact, the Miller-Urey experiment actually shows uh, that life would not form this way, um, even though it's always touted as evidence for chemical evolution. It's, always, it's actually the opposite. I mean, first of all, they use the wrong um, gases. Now even the evolutionists don't believe that the Earth had a methane ammonia atmosphere. That says not what evolutionists believe anymore. Mm -hmm. Now, they, well, they, they cannot have oxygen in this mixture because uh, it would stop anything from forming. And oxygen is actually quite reactive. That's why you take antioxidants. It's actually quite a, quite a reactive molecule. You don't think about it that way. Um, but if it was present, you wouldn't get any of these, any primordial soups forming. But another problem is if you haven't got oxygen, you haven't got an ozone layer because oxygen ozone yes. is three atoms of oxygen, so you can't okay. have ozone without oxygen, and therefore UV light would destroy everything. Yeah, That's so one problem. So you're saying that not only do they have they not found a solution to this issue today, but it's actually worse for the evolutionists now. 
Well, I think so. I mean, see, also you can't protect yourself in water. You realize you can get sunburned underwater. You can get sunburned while you're swimming. You can get sunburned on a cloudy day. So water is not going to stop uh, UV from destroying these things. But the Miller-Urey experiment actually had a trap to isolate uh, these molecules as soon as they were formed. So they wouldn't be destroyed by the radiation that formed them or the energy that sort of formed them. That's one uh, big problem. They've got uh, what we call unacceptable um, intelligent interference by the investigator. And yet we're supposed to be seeing how life could have formed without any intelligent input, and yet there's a huge amount of intelligent input already. And that's not even the, the only thing wrong with it. Not only that, but I understand that the chemicals that were produced in the miller urea experiment, they were actually the wrong kind of chemicals, the wrong kind of molecules that we need. So we talk mm -hmm. about chirality, right? So that's um, in, in life, molecules come in either right-handed form as well as left-handed form. Mm. Um, and um, amino acids come in with a left-handed form and sugars like RNA or DNA, they're in a right-handed form. So all living things have, have it this way. In the miller urea experiment, there was a mix of both right and hand, left-handed molecules. That is a real problem because especially when it comes to the uh, DNA, you could not get a double helix forming if you haven't got all sugars one hand. You disrupt the double helix, which means you disrupt the base pairing, and therefore it could not store the information required for life. And in fact, even if you try to grow a part of the, the, the nucleic acid, if you have the wrong-handed um, uh, sugar, it disrupts the growing of the chain. There's a lot of different things wrong with that. And I know from, I'm a PhD chemist, I've done these experiments myself, okay, you, you make a chiral compound, you get an equal mixture of left and right. So how do you separate it? You introduce something from nature that is already one-handed, and that reacts differently with the left and the right. So you can separate them, um, but the next, the sequel to that was I added a bit of charcoal into the mixture, and I went back to the mixture, the equal Wait, left that? and right. Uh, because um, there's an equal, uh, these things have equal energy, left and right are identical energy. So um, left goes to right, right goes to left. There's an equal chance of both. So if you've got um, a reaction that's ready to go, re conversion is, is quite easy, then it's going to eventually give a 50-50 mixture. Just like you throw coins, uh, you're going to get 50 heads, 50, 50 tails on average. So in other words, not only the Miller-Urey experiment show that um, life could not have happened, it actually shows that it's almost impossible for the first living cell to have occurred by chance. Well, I mean, see, we have to, it's actually quite interesting that people have tried to use the racemization of amino acids to give a date of something, because that's the tendency. It goes towards the racemic mixture, not towards the single-handedness. Hmm. That's a huge problem. Okay. And then you look at the experiments, oh, we've finally solved that problem. Well, they said that two years ago and five years ago and 10 years ago, saying the same <laughs> thing. We've finally solved the problem, which admits they didn't really solve it the previous time. And so bear that in mind, next time you see, oh, we've finally solved that. Well, you didn't solve it the previous time you said that. Okay, so Jono, also with the Miller-Urey experiment, they claim to have formed some amino acids, which we already said is actually from the left, it's from the wrong mixture. But it's mm -hmm. not only that, because you do not, not just need amino acids, you need formic acid, you need um, DNA, you need um, lots of other things to form, much more complex things that the Miller-Urey experiment could not account for. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, like, like you say, the more energy you put in, the more heat you put in there, the faster it will actually destroy, and that's why you need it. Oh. Maybe. Well, you say because uh, they found the traces of amino acids, but what are you going to do with them? I mean, no one actually takes um, the components of the Miller experiment from the trap and does anything with them. They What they do is they find some amino acids in the Miller experiment in trace amounts, and then they go to the chemical company and buy, get some pure amino acids and very controlled reactions and try and do the next step. They never actually do it with the, the reaction from the Miller experiment itself. There's no way they could do it because there's so many things in that that would stop any for more progress. Like formic acid, that's a component of ant sting. You see, what that would do, if, if you try to get that mixture to form proteins, the formic acid would, would react and stop any ch protein chain from growing. It would completely... Um, stop the, the, the chains growing and therefore it would actually um, stop any life from forming. 
And that's what you don't actually hear much about. I mean, and yet you've got about five times more formic acid than any amino acid produced. Uh, so it's just not a possible reaction mixture because of the contamination. So Jono, in other words, even when we just look at the chemistry of the first living cell, mm -hmm. we know that it includes design. There has to be a design in there. Well, that, that's, the, that's the thing that you need to have these uh, steps. Every step of the way, there's a lot of design, purification, controlling the temperature, controlling the, uh, the pH, which is acidity, um, controlling the salinity. All these things have to be controlled. The timing has to be controlled uh, in the right order. So it really has no parallel but to what a primordial soup would do. In general, with the, um, with the Miller UV experiment as well, there is an issue with hydrolysis. And we actually covered some of that in our documentary, The Evolutionary Achilles Hill. Mm. Okay. Well, it's a very important point because, you see, when small molecules combine into big molecules, that's, that process is a big word, uh, polymerization. Okay, but don't be afraid of the big words. Um, but also, every time it happens, it ejects a water molecule, so it's called condensation. So mm. the thing is, to get a, a protein from amino acids, any chemist is going to take water out of the reaction. We're even going to have water absorbing chemicals to remove water. See, water's the last place you want to do this sort of reaction. But last I heard, there's a lot of water in primordial soup. Yeah, in the oceans. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's usually a good component of oceans is water. And that's going to um, drive the reaction in the reverse direction. Mm -hmm. That's a huge problem. Now, especially if you have long periods of time, because the longer period of time is the enemy of this process, because the longer you have, the longer you have to reach the equilibrium, which is in the direction of the small molecules, not the big ones. So you, the time is, is an enemy, not a friend. So basically, it breaks the chemical down the, longer, the more time you have. Well, in fact, we saying? know for, from experiments that's largely hydrolysis. You see, we see this. This is experimentally verified. Jono, can you elaborate more on cross reactions and why it's an issue for this experiment too? Now, okay, when you cook food, you have browning reactions. Now, there are basically several different types of browning reaction. One is called the Maillard reaction. That's when you have these sugars and the amino acids reacting together, forming brown material, which adds to the flavors. But the problem is that's no good for the origin of life because you want the amino acids to form proteins, you want the sugars to form DNA, uh, but in reality, they would actually react with each other and destroy each other. You see, so this is what would happen in a primordial soup. You've got to, when you try to mix these things, they're going to do all sorts of wrong reactions. I mean, any chemist knows that if you want to try to get the reaction right, you have to protect against these wrong reactions. You add a protecting group, and then you take the protecting group off after you've done the thing you need to do. But there's no organic chemist in the primordial soup to do all these things. So cross-reactions is another big problem for chemical evolution. Does the reactions go in the wrong sort of way? Wrong from the point of view of life coming from non-living chemicals. Okay, so John, I'll just sum up what we have discussed so far. So we have established at the beginning that chemical evolution is a part of evolutionary theory. Mm -hmm. We have shown that um, natural selection is irrelevant unless we can first explain how the first cell came about. And Very look, important point to make, you know, is that people overlook this. Even for the first living cell, when we talk about chemical evolution, we think about Mueller, the Mueller-Urey experiment. And we show that everything that was produced in the experiment actually works against evolution. We show that they produced the wrong um, chemicals. We show that they, they had to use special traps to isolate um, chemicals so that they do not cross-react and that doesn't happen in nature. We have actually shown that um, the molecules that were formed, they were all in the wrong-handed form. They were mixed together. That destroys the possibility of life forming. And amino acids alone isn't enough. We, we need the formation of formic acid. We need DNA. We need many other components to be able to have life. And so at the end of the day, we put all these things together and we show that not only are evolutionists not able to explain how the first life arisen, but what we know from science today makes it even more impossible for them to explain. And so Jono, um, one of, we mentioned earlier on that one of the DVDs that cover some of these things um, is actually like hydrolysis and things like that. That's from our documentary, The Evolutionary Achilles Hill. 
Um, is there anything yeah, you, you like can to find it up? in the links below? In fact, that's a lot of the, the animations on this video are mostly from uh, Evolution's Achilles Heel. So it's a very useful uh, video to show to people. It comes in nine different um, uh, parts. Very easy to show it over several um, Sunday schools or um, adult Sunday schools, uh, Sabbath schools. <laughs> okay, and it also comes with a free study study guide with it. So it's a very important thing to show people why evolution doesn't work and have people who are experts in their fields talking about the problems with evolution, the the Achilles heels of evolution and also the ethical implications of evolution are discussed in that book too in the video and the book so thank you for joining us we encourage you to continue to learn more about this on creation.com and we look forward to seeing you again thank you